Writers Festival, new released Sunday, where we get to uh, meet in person uh, an Australian writer with a new work. And uh, what a pleasure it is uh, to welcome today a, a, a name, a face, and particularly a voice that will be known and loved by many of you from, among many other things, his many years bringing us words and writing on ABC Radio National's books and writing program, novelist, essayist, translator of some of the great masters of literature, Chekhov, Henri Gide, Turgenev, to name a few, dare I say, man of letters, the one and only Robert Desai, joining us today to discuss his new, and I believe his 10th book, The Time of Our Lives, Growing Older Well. Robert Desai, welcome. Thank you, Michael, pleased to be here with you. Uh, it's so lovely that you've been able to join us from your um, from your beautiful home. I can see behind you in Hobart, a, a city both of us know very well. Um, the Time of Our Lives, uh, uh, it, it's such a joyous book, Robert, though I had trouble describing it. It's, it's not a novel. It's not a, sh a collection of uh, uh, short stories, although redolent with story, it most certainly is. Um, nor is it a nor is it a, a a guide, if you will, to aging as such. Heaven forbid. But uh, as we were saying in our preliminary conversation the other day, the word almanac kept popping into my head because when I tried to classify, it, and that's because I think I found it to be something of a a kaleidoscope, a series of um, beautifully rendered observations and adventures both of the body and the spirit so how does that sound <laughs> as a description <laughs> so, well, kaleidoscope is one of my favorite words and i have to ration we're off to a good start <laughs> so i've used it about twice in this book maybe three times kaleidoscoping is you see how i feel i actually live i'm not sure if it's wise or not but it's how i live i take the small number of pieces the small number of shards that I have, actually, that anyone has, and I shake them from now, from time to time, and hope a beautiful pattern will emerge. That's <laughs> about all I can do. And it's how I see almost everything. I go out the front door in the morning, and I give the world a bit of a shake and see what appears. So kaleidoscoping is particularly apt for the inner life, of course. Oh, and by the way, thank you for playing Prakwatyev just now. That's Romeo and Juliet, actually, and it's the ball scene, and it's one of my uh, favorite pieces of music. It's um, unutterably exciting to hear it again. March of the Capulets, is it not? Yes, that's right. It, it's at the ball, yes. Mm -hmm. At the ball. Let's talk a little of that um, in the life, because um, it's one of the really enduring themes, the key, if you like, to what you're saying in the book, growing older well. And I'm so glad, Robert, you called it growing older well and not growing old well. So congratulations there. Uh, I'd love to drill down a little bit of what that, what your notion of an inner life really means. And I'm going to uh, start by just reading a, a little bit. One of the, um, I've, I've, I've got a few quotes. I could simply read the book because the quotes, are, there are so many. Um, your one of your earlier definitions of what you take to be the richness of, of an inner life. Um, <clears throat> uh, where are we here? I like to think of an inner life as if it were a cherished piece of music, an intricate, intricate composition, deeply felt, not simply understood, springing from a shared cultural bedrock, although shaped by our own individual memories over a lifetime. It is the lifeblood of our imagination. This composition doesn't have to be Beethoven's ninth. The overarching sense of meaning that such an inner life furnishes us with can serve as a bulwark against the constant splintering of meaning, the relentless breaking up of memory into scattered shards that, that the world of digitized chatter and aimless velocity exacerbates. It eases our anxiety about our aging bodies, about the slow collapse of our outer selves, trapped by the clock, by entropy, and gives us heart in the face of the loneliness that comes with the emptying out of the world we were once at home in, the culling, not always gentle, of our intimate friends. Uh, 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 the word that you use in that passage that stands out to me, Robert, is bulwark. It's as if the inner life that you describe is a shield, indeed a bulwark, to a lot of the loneliness that comes with aging. 
wasn't expecting you to say that, I, I have to say. Wasn't expecting you to choose bulwark. It's a good it, word, though. <laughs> I'm pleased. Well, it's a strong word, isn't it? But I don't mean to shut the outer world out exactly, but I mean to keep something safe and looked after, really. And what I'm trying to keep safe is a dance. It is a dance. The important word is dance. The book begins with a dance. It's Vulevo Kushiavik Ma, which is a rather vulgar sort of thing to dance to. And it ends with something much closer to the sort of dance you were talking about there. That is Javanese classical dancing in a pavilion, a pandopo, for those of you who have been to Indonesia many times, uh, an Indonesian pavilion with the pillars and the joglo roof, in which children are learning actually Indian dances. Uh -huh. That is to say the cultural roots go back and back and back into prehistory. And this is what I mean by an inner dance, that just sort of thinking about your children or about learning Chinese one day doesn't really constitute an inner life. It is choreographed, I think, to really work well, to really feed you, to hold you together against the nothingness that will try to absorb you and splinter you and, well, really make you evaporate. So you're right, it is a bulwark. It is the only strength you've got in certain situations, mm. I think. But it's not just sort of thinking to yourself about this and that, at least in my understanding of the word. It is an intricate performed self. It's conversation, really. With One of the things, what the, uh, the other impression I'm, I'm left with is uh, of, of what, what you take to be in inner life for me after reading the book is summed up in one word, Robert, curiosity. You seem to me still an enduringly curious person and it's your curiosity, I think, for the world and for the stimulation of the world that drives the book. Would you agree with that? Well, a few people have said that curiosity is something that I exhibit. You see, I don't feel it. Well, I mean, you don't feel things about yourself. Of course, I'm curious. I mean, I'm not here for long, and the world is absolutely fascinating. There aren't enough hours in the day to read and talk about and think about and hear about all the things that take my interest, and I can't always foresee what it might be. Um, I think it's one of the things that keeps you alive, it's curiosity. If you have none, then why stay here really? But it's best anchored. I'm curious about Russian things. It's anchored. It's anchored in a study of Russian language and literature. It's anchored in a lot of reading. If you take, what else would it be? Music, my music, and music forms the inner life of many Australians. My musical knowledge is not well anchored. My partner, Peter, has much better anchoring in music. And he has, over the years, given me more and more understanding so that I'm sending out tendrils rather than anchors into music. It's not enough to just be idly curious. I think, that's what I think. You seem though so driven in the book by, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate this, what I felt to be your curiosity because it is to me very stimulating you're you seem fascinated still by ideas particularly by people particularly by your friends which we'll get to in a moment uh, cultures food uh, not drink as you <laughs> as you uh, uh, point out but there still seems to be that almost childlike interest in the world and we'll get to uh, what the importance of what you think is of, of being a child in the world still holds going in, into old age but to me, that's that bulwark again, that that not sort of uh, in your book, not, not, not accepting that the world is a closed book. You're still open to it because you seem very open to uh, what the world still has to, has to give you. Well, I feel very free, you see. I mean, I feel that I can choose and so I do. I mean, it's a form of play. Yes. <laughs> you take, well, language. I'm learning Indonesian at the moment, you see, and I'm quite hopeless at it, but I just love doing it. And it opens up bits of Java for me. It opens up bits of Sumatra. 
And in those places are people. And you hit the nail on the head when you said the word people. As I grow older, it's more people that interest me and how they cope with being alive. That's really what interests me. If I go to India, I've been going to India every year, not obviously in the last year, but in general, I go to India every year. What I'm interested in is not actually so much this temple or that temple, this mountain, this valley. It's the people I meet and how they cope with what the world has served up to them, which is often things that I could barely imagine here in St. George's Terrace in Hobart, not really. This is what interests me. And so we talk and I listen and I try to grow close. It's so hard to grow close to people, but I try. And actual facts about the Himalayas or about this temple or about the history of Chennai aren't quite so interesting to me except as background to growing close to this one, that one, this woman, this man. Women, of course, are much easier to grow close to than men. Yes, and yeah. the women, the, your, the women friends in your life uh, uh, play such a strong part in the book, particularly um, the, the, the friend who you've, you've and I, I understand it's not always the actual names of your friends, and that, that's fine. You know, there's Sarah, Barbara, Katerina, but you paint their wisdom so well, Robert. You paint their their quirks and you, you you paint their elegance and you seem to really derive such nourishment from being around these people. I think that's what I meant by that endless sort of curiosity um, and abil ability to be continually stimulated by the people around you and, and to learn from them. Well, coping is such a difficult thing to do. I mean, we think that it will be all right, we will get a job, we'll get married, we'll build a house, we'll get a Volvo, whatever it is, and we'll then sort of sail on a predetermined course through life, and it will all work. And then we'll be put away somewhere in an aged care facility, but it will all work. It's not like that. You have to cope all the time, every day, with something. And it's how people do this, and they do it in ways that I haven't thought of, or they do it in ways that I don't really want to do. But that's what interests me. When you look out into the world, it's not actually a beautiful place. It's an abattoir and we're walking through it every day. I try to be a vegetarian, of course, to lessen the sense of abattoir and yes. not always successfully, but for the most part successfully. And we have to cope with it. I mean, a century ago, you could really shut your eyes to many things, not everything. But now the world in all its horror is in vivid color and in motion live on television every night and coping is quite difficult. So that's what I'm interested in. There are two personalities in the book really, since you've mentioned these women. With the women, I'm much more open. I listen, at least I hope you felt that I listened. I didn't always agree with them. Sometimes they thought I was being a bit silly and would say so. And that's true. When I'm alone, <clears throat> I can get a bit shouty. I can start laying down the law a bit. <laughs> and so there aren't so many pages where I'm totally alone. <laughs> I start waving my arms around. And that's not always good. It's all right as a character in the book, I suppose. But you include in the book, in your uh, uh, conversations with these people, all those wonderful gentle scoldings that they give of you saying, oh, Robert, you're being silly. You're talking too much. You are indeed waving those ar arms around. And you kind of take that on the chin, which is very nice. Um, so so uh, uh, what was I, I going to say? E even at this stage, I mean, you're not afraid to be corrected in that sense by someone that you respect, which is a very endearing part of um, reading the book. I don't mind being corrected. I don't want to be mocked. I mean, nor do you, nor does anyone. You don't really want to be um, made to look foolish, I suppose. No, no, but no. In any friendship, and all these women are my friends, there are going to be moments when they have to speak to you frankly. <laughs> And they have to sort of say, without saying it, I'm very fond of you, but I, I have this to say to you. And then they say it. That's part of friendship. And and perhaps, perhaps as you get older, 
you can actually uh, uh, bear that more. You actually expect your friends to be more, to more, to more honest, perhaps a little bit more brutal, because what you're going to get from them being more honest is actually more valuable. Well, one of the things that I'm trying to say in this book, and in fact, there's a whole chapter about it, I suppose, is that I don't care so much now at this age. And I find that other people my age don't care so much about anything, really. We have a much smaller area of concern into which we retreat. And we go down much more deeply than we used to into that reduced area. The horizons draw in. So at some level, I don't care, really if a lot of people don't like me or don't agree with me. I don't care if I've been wrong about a whole lot of things. Not really, not anymore. When you're 23, it's probably important. I mean, when you're 23, as I say there, you worry that people don't like you very much. Um, and then when you're in your mid forties, perhaps you decide you don't care whether they like you any very much or not. When you're my age, you realize, Nobody gives a stuff about you at all. Nobody. I mean, if I dropped dead here in front of you, no one person would really care. I mean, to the point of not having dinner tonight. Other people would be sorry. Other people would write letters of condolence. But only one person, and the dog, I must say, would be deeply touched. Oh. People are not thinking about you. They are not judging you. They are looking at you when it works in with their day. Otherwise, they're not looking. So I don't care. I'm at a point where I will say what I think about almost everything, not quite everything, and take it on the chin, as you put it, if there is a negative reaction. The description you gave to the world earlier, Robert, of like walking through an abattoir, is this an attitude of the world that you've developed in these years, or have you always felt that? I think it struck me over the last 10 years much more. When you're young again, I suppose you think that the things that you don't like are on the outside. And if you grew up in the 60s, as I did, you really did believe, though I missed a lot about the 60s, drugs, for example, you do believe that everything's going to get better. I mean, people are going to love each other and wars are going to stop and troops will come home from Vietnam and everything will be fabulous. Well, no, they're not fabulous at all. Those were just current examples of the brutality of human beings towards animals and towards themselves. And I really don't see things getting better at all, except in certain, mm, well, on certain questions of physical comfort. Of course, things are better. Obviously, I can see that. But as I've got older, the euphoria of the 60s has gradually evaporated into nothing. And what's happening in the United States doesn't help. Um, we know about your love of European languages and culture. You're an um, um, academic. You told me earlier for 20 years, was it, uh, teaching Russian language and literature in several universities across Australia. Much of the book, though, was set in Java, which was new to me. Tell me, what is it about this culture and what's been the transition in from the European culture to the Asian culture that's, uh, um, uh, that's affected you so much? Yes, it's a good question. I'm not sure exactly what the answer is. I am a very European person. I come out of the Enlightenment in Paris, really, and also in England, in Scotland. I, that's what I come out of. But late in life, I started to find Europe slightly tedious. It was like, I think I've said so somewhere, going there was like visiting the grandparents. I mean, <laughs> it's a, a worthy thing to do and sorts of things about the grandparents' parlor that I can appreciate and admire. But really, I wanted to go somewhere where the slate was wiped clean, where I would be innocent. I don't mean by that that I would be good or virtuous, but innocent where I would be a blank and I could be, in a sense, anything I liked. So I started going to India and then latterly to Indonesia, where everything is so foreign to me and the understanding of who I am is so slight that, yes, I feel innocent. I do feel like 
a child again. I mean, where I go in Java is central Java. It's heavily Islamic and it's becoming more Islamic by the minute. I'm a deeply un-Islamic person, as you can tell from reading my book. But I feel not at home there, but I feel stimulated to have important conversations with myself there of a kind I don't feel stimulated or New York or Berlin. So I will continue going there if I can. Is that the freedom of being an out of being a cultural outsider perhaps because you because you can't really enmesh yourself in a culture you don't understand you don't feel beholden to it and i'm also granted all sorts of liberties because i'm a stupid foreigner if you see what i mean <laughs> so i'm allowed to do all sorts of things that locals can't do and the freedom that i think is a mark of my life i've been very fortunate in that that really rises to the surface and I just become so open and so empty in some ways, open to experience, open to colors, to smells, to saying things I might otherwise say that I would not say in Berlin, for example, I would not say in Paris. So far, it's really been really good. In this book, you won't learn a lot about Java that you don't already know. Perhaps the main thing is their attitude to time. And attitudes to time are, of course, a very important part of this book since when you get to my age, you start to run out of it. Um, there's a lovely passage I'd, I'd like to read from it. And to me, it's almost that uh, 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 transition that you made from your love of European culture, not, not mutually exclusive, of course, but, but embracing a different type of culture. And it's to, to do with the secret garden door, I think, in which you had a, um, a, a beautiful garden that was very ordered. I see that as the European side. And then you let the garden go and it didn't matter, but I'll, I, I won't print it, I'll just read it. There was always a secret door in the garden wall to follow for forays into balmier, headier, untidier corners where date palms grew, hibiscus rioted and jasmine trailed abundantly across the warm stone walls. But the main garden my mind used to take pleasure in was ordered and coherent. Over the years, the secret door has sagged and hung open. The garden wall itself has begun to crumble and everywhere you'd look, it's a jumble of colors and shapes to delight the inner eye. The paths through it meander instead of forming tight patterns. The fragrances are spicier, redolent of Gujarat. Yes. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Gujarat or Java, as often as not, it's mishmash, unfinished, it adds up to nothing at all, and I don't care. Who'd have thought? <laughs> it sounds as if, uh, Robert, you're more surprised than anyone to have arrived at this, where you could bear to imbue yourself with a Javanese garden as opposed to a European garden. I am a bit shocked. It's true, I'm a bit shocked, because when I was younger, I was famous amongst my friends for what they called blinds down over India. You'd get back on the plane in Singapore to head to London, it would be nighttime, blinds would come down, you'd wake up in London. And I travel a lot and I would go, I suppose, most years, sometimes twice a year. Blinds down between Singapore and about Turkey, I think the sun usually used to come up, perhaps it still does when you go to London. And so, yes, I am surprised. Uh, it's humbling, of course. It's humbling to realize that one has shut out these vast, complicated, intricate, beautiful, demanding civilizations all one's life. And now I'm too old. I mean, the civilization of Java, which has its roots in Hinduism and in Buddhism, and of course, before that, in native uh, religions, Javanese religions and worldviews. But India, I mean, India is endless in its fascinations and its intellectual challenges and its contradictions and its anger and its delight and both are very sensual places and when you get old I don't find Europe sensual at all I find Europe preening it preens and tries to be sexy sexy is not sensual I find India and Java both very sensual and when you're my age you're grateful for every little bit of sensuality you can get Yes, we'll get to that later. The 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 um, uh, uh, liberation from well, not well, certainly perhaps uh, not from sexuality, but from sex and all it actually uh, uh, it, it entails. But there's a lovely quote in your uh, very complex 
um, um, and rich definition of an inner life that I'd like to ask. You quoted as uh, pleasure in endless patternings, which I do like. And it comes back to that kaleidoscope we were talking before uh, about before those endless patternings of a kaleidoscope. Um, uh, endless patternings, wh where did you... Um, uh, I, 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 I just want you to tease that out a bit because it, it's such an enduring phrase for me, Robert. Well, I'm saying that the inner life is patterned. I mean, if you want to think of one word, it would be the word tango. 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 Okay. I think of the inner life as a mixture of play or playfulness and discipline. That's why I think of the tango. I mean, I have tangoed, not very well, but I go to dance classes and- we on I, YouTube somewhere, no, no doubt. Oh, God, tangoing, I'm sure. I didn't care enough to get the exact positioning of the little finger and all that sort of thing to try to do with the tango. But I did appreciate the fact that it was sexy, it was sensual, it was beautiful, but it was also highly disciplined. So you've got this mixture of play and discipline. And that's what I would like to hone and excel at in my life. The two things together, just play by itself is too loose. It doesn't sort of satisfy deeply, but when you make it intricate and patterned uh, with a shape, the arabesque is of course a shape that I admire particularly, then it starts to acquire strength and power. And so that's how I try to live now. It doesn't always work. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how I would explain it. You give us a contrast, though, to what life uh, in the cow was not really a cow, because I assume that she was a, a real person, your, your, your partner's mother, Rita, who passes away during the course of the book. And uh, Rita did not have what you would describe as an inner life. And it's it's a sad passing because you're almost longing for this woman's, not this woman's life, mm. but what this woman's life could have actually been. Mm. This is a woman who, has, who seemed to have no interests, no hobbies, no kind of interest in either anything or any person. And her, her loneliness, as you describe, is a punishment for not caring about others. Yes, some think I've been a little cruel towards her, but Peter himself doesn't think so. I was very deeply fond of Rita. Did I love her? Love is a word I try to use sparingly, hmm. unless it's about rhubarb and ice cream or something terribly fundamental, <laughs> or chocolate liqueurs. But about people, I would use it very, very sparingly. And I think what I felt was a deep attachment and fondness, which isn't quite the same thing. Rita, of course, a feminist would point out, comes from that generation of women. She was born in I think, uh, 1922. Yeah. Uh, when she died, she was in her mid nineties. The, the World War II era and Depression era, yes, it was a very different yes, world. And then, then went through the depression. Her husband went through the depression, but it, it's instead of women like that, and it was true of my own mother, it was true of my adoptive mother, more importantly. <clears throat> sorry, it was true of my biological mother rather than my adoptive mother. These women were crushed quite often, not always, by men, by the men that they lived with, particularly men who perhaps not uh, very well educated. And I think that Rita was crushed by a man, actually. And he, no doubt, was also crushed. I mean, one can look for blame infinitely going back generations. There's no point in doing that. But I think that an inner life had been crushed out of her and she did not feel worthy of having one. But if you don't have one, then you cannot reconfigure the outer world as it hits you. Nothing happens. It hits you, an empty sound, clunk. In it comes clunk. When you have an inner life, of course, you reconfigure what is just coming. The sights, the sounds, the smells, whatever it might be, the conversations, and you become creative in some sense. Rita couldn't do that. And I didn't feel I should say that I love her when I don't. I mean, I said that about my, my uh, birth mother. I did not love her. I know you're supposed to. I did not love her. And I think it's much better to stare particularly at a certain point, just stare the facts in the face. 
and find the right word for them. Hmm. Is an inner life something that has to be learned, you think? Perhaps Rita's and the women of Rita's generation were not taught. It was considered perhaps a luxury when she was 10 years old, that oppression was on in the Second World War. Is it, is it something that uh, we in our luckier eras are able to indulge in perhaps, that they weren't? Yes, but it's also, I mean, I didn't want to say this. It's a class thing. She was told she was a stupid woman. Hmm. <sighs> It was a class thing. I'm sure it was said amongst the rich, but probably mm, it would be more difficult in certain social classes for the men to get away with it, scot-free. I think she did have the thought crushed out of her that she might be able to create anything at all, let alone an inner life. Yeah, yeah. I don't think she was a miserable person, but she was bored out of her mind. We well, see boredom is something I have never felt. I have not experienced boredom, except when I'm caught having gone through customs in the waiting room at an airport, the plane is infinitely delayed, but I can't get out. It's that amazing mixture of infinity and constriction, which is the essence of boredom. But in normal life, no, I never feel bored. I mean, it's just not possible to feel bored. It's just not possible. Read something, ring someone up, have a conversation, go and talk to yourself in the back garden. You'll be surprised what sorts of things you might say to yourself. It's funny because boredom, boredom in, the, in the book seems to be the only thing you're afraid of, Robert. I love the, the, the quote that you give us about boredom. The mere quote, the merest whiff of boredom chills me to the marrow, you declare in a very Wildian sort of way, if I may say so. And also that nothing is really worth doing when you're bored. I mean, you seem to rail against boredom in this sense more than you do about death. It's more immediately pressing, isn't it? <laughs> and maybe you're right, maybe I have a deep fear of boredom, but I have successfully avoided it. In the aged care home where Rita died, where we would go about five times a week, not seven, I, I admit, you felt boredom lying on top of you, yes. like some sort of heavy, wet, steaming blanket. It was hideous, uh, smelling of of uh, lasagna. You know how old people take yes. lasagna? Yes. Infinitely. Uh, as do uh, Qantas flights, actually. Maybe I'm not allowed to say that. But <laughs> I find that kind of smell of nothing happening except meals. Stultifying. Yes. Stupefying. So perhaps I am afraid of boredom, but I don't think that I'm going to be much affected by that. There's too much going on inside. If I feel at a loose end, I will just translate everything I'm looking at into Russian, you see, and that keeps me lively. And then I can try French or I can try Indonesian, not very successfully usually, but I can do that. And every time you choose another language, a new self pops up and you rocked. Here's a French speaking one, here's a Russian speaking one. You, you, it was interesting to hear you talking about your earlier life just just now because uh, that was something that I found curiously absent from the book. You you talk about memory, of course, but very little of what I would call dwelling on the past is in the book. There's no there's no re revisits to your early life, your adoption as a baby after the war, um, never knowing your natural father. I know you discussed this in uh, A Mother's Disgrace earlier, um, studying in Moscow during the Cold War, fascinating stuff. All, all but absent here, was this a conscious decision? Is this a book where the details of your own life, your own earlier life, your own history were not needed? Conscious decision is not quite the right expression. I write books in order to forget <laughs> whatever it was that I'm, I'm interested in at the time. So I was interested in André Gide. So I researched him, went to North Africa and France, wrote a book about him. I really don't want to know anything more about André Gide. Now and again, people write to me and say, you know, did you know a new letter by André Gide has just been discovered in Luxembourg? Couldn't give... Don't, don't care. Gone. Don't care. Gone. I did my adopted, adopted parents. I did my life. I did go into Russia in my first book. Done. Of course, you know, in real life, one mentions these things from time to time. But really, each book 
is an attempt to leap across some kind of chasm that has just opened up at my feet. Every one of them, I mean, with HIV, suddenly this yes. chasm. So I leap across it with this book. I try to grow wings and leap across it. That's the book. And that was so with every book. And with this book, of course, the chasm is the last chasm. It's old age and death. And so I try to float above it. I mean, I hope that you will agree with me that it's not a dark book. Whatever I said about abattoirs, this is not a dark book. I'm not a dark person. No. No, I hope that it is a light book. Well, it's funny. It, it's, it is a, a, a light book. And you manage, I found, very deftly and lightly to take us across the pages of your book. But it's only about halfway I began to feel, Robert, that I'd been a little tricked because you deal us in, almost by sleight of hand, I might say, into some quite profound notions about not just ageing, but life in general, inner peace, tranquility, and the important distinction you make between, and I'd like you to talk about it, to talk to it a little bit, if you could, between happiness and contentment, because they're quite distinct um, um, ideas, aren't they? They end up distinct. At the beginning of the book, I'm sort of um, a bit, uh, well, my ideas are more blurry. And so I say happy when really I mean contented. Towards the end of the book, I start to refine these ideas, yes. For me, contentment is what we aim for and it can never be complete. It is a kind of inner peace about our ability to cope with the work. It can never be complete because we're completely contented while there is suffering in the world and there will, in our lifetimes, always be suffering. One is never completely contented. One has to simply do one's best. Happiness can be complete, and it comes in great bursts. For example, for me, when dancing the tango, I am stupendously happy. I am just, uh, I'm a little distillation of joy. Happiness is beyond your control in a certain way, although you can put yourself in the way of it. For example, by going to gay dancing classes, which is what I did. You can put yourself in the way of it, but you can't tell it to drop on you. So that's why they are rather different things. And I don't think there's any mystery about happiness. People write books about it. I'm, I think even David Malouf has written a book about it. There's no problem. Just ask people what makes them happy. Tell them to write it down and they will. There's no mystery. I mean, what makes me happy is going to India. I mean, sex, if it's good, makes anyone happy. But of course, as you get older, it becomes a rarer event in the calendar, naturally. But apart from sex, it's friendship. Does friendship make me happy? Maybe it makes me more contented. Although the moments of supreme intimacy in friendship, that particular kind of intimacy that you can only have with a special kind of friend, that makes me happy. Certain kinds of music. I think I mentioned Queen. I think I mentioned What's his name? His name starts with, who, who, who came from Zanzibar. What's his name in Queen? Who sings Mama? Oh, um, uh, you see, proper names go out the window. Yes. <laughs> um, perhaps we perhaps we can agree that um, maybe happiness falls on you. Uh, contentment sort of settles on you. Perhaps perhaps that's a fairer. <laughs> Uh, definition. <laughs> yeah, when, when you, you grow in, it's, it's the matrix that you grow in, that you live in, if you've lived wisely. But as you know, I'm not a great believer in tranquility. There was tons of tranquility in Rita's old age facility. Tranquility in every corner. I'm not in favour of tranquility, except after 11pm, obviously, for very good reasons. I'm in favour of animation. Those people who sit going om, give me the willies, actually. Why would you sit going om? Get out there, do something, talk to somebody, read something, sing something. Why would you want to be tranquil? So the god that I like among the Hebrew gods, not Hebrew, Hindu gods, is Ganesha. Ganesha is dancing. He's got one knee raised, one leg across the other, and his arms, he's got quite a few of them, are raised. Dance. I was interested when Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the expert on grief, you remember, said at the end of her life, when she knew she was dying, she said, I wish I had danced more. 
and I'm sure she did. I wish I had danced more. I was very, very good and didn't do a lot of dancing until far too late. It's one of the regrets I have. I don't have many regrets, but I wish I danced more. Yes, I do. I don't want to be tranquil. I'm going to be dead for the rest of time. You talk about, and, and that doesn't seem to fear you. Uh, it doesn't seem to, 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 to scare you. Um, the word that comes up that you seem, that I sense that you had a kind of a, a uh, th that gave you the heebie-jeebies was not death, but annihilation. And maybe that's an extinction. Do you worry about a kind of a legacy? Are you, or are you, as you quote, Gore Vidal, when he was asked, oh, Gore, oh, Gore, what will your legacy be? He says, I don't give a damn. <laughs> well, are, you on, are you in Gore's part there? Yes, absolutely. No, I'm not afraid of extinction, annihilation, extermination. Uh, they're all scary words, of course, and one doesn't invite them because it's never quite the moment, is it? I mean, I have been extinguished twice in hospital and there is nothing to be afraid of because there is nothing there. Indeed, there is no there there, which is what we all actually deep down thought was probably the case all along, and indeed it is. So there's nothing to fear. I find that those who are most anxious about death are those who believe in an afterlife. And they used to be even more anxious until about 1500 when they believed that all sorts of ghastly things could happen to them, probably would happen to them on death. For the last 500 years, belief in that kind of thing has certainly been reduced. But I find that Christians, Muslims, Jews who believe the stories that are told to them, uh, the scriptural stories or the uh, belief stories, faith stories, are more likely to be anxious about positioning themselves correctly for what yes, yes, possibly yes. will come. Then people like me, we don't care about that whatsoever. <laughs> it's that thing of, oh my goodness, I've, I've um, spent a whole life in our afterlife more bloody responsibility and how am I going to shape up in the afterlife and that's right anything of anything worse yes you certainly um uh uh I, I like how you pour rather delicious scorn on that um on Dylan Thomas's raging against the dying of the light you say well so what that's completely it isn't something you can rail against successfully anyway and it's not your your um uh you don't even have that Camus kind of fight fight against death, do you? It's not like, it, it, because Camus, from what I understand, had that kind of like, it, it can't be, even can't be acknowledged, it has to be sort of fought to the bitter end, completely pointless. I just enjoy the puddle of time that I'm in. And I don't even look to other puddles of time particularly I don't live in the minutes, of course, or in the moment. I mean, only blowflies do that. And I would have to say, to some extent, in aged care facilities, there are a lot of people living in the minute. I don't want to live in the minute, but I'm happy to live in a sort of large splodge of time. <laughs> Nothing too close to clock time. I don't want to live in a, in a chain of links of time. I just want to enjoy this odd shape. It's like a Persian carpet, actually. I was looking at Persian carpets this morning on YouTube, and I thought, that is very much the way I think. Persian carpet has lots of repetitions, which when you're my age, life simply does. But it has its own beauty, and you simply enjoy sitting on it while you're there. There might be other carpets, perhaps in other rooms there are other carpets, but for now, just sit on it, have a cup of tea, enjoy yourself. You talk about the importance of, um, uh, well, you that wonderful quote that I didn't know where it came from. You're only young once, but immaturity can last a lifetime. Um, you you talk to that a, a little, and it's lovely. I, I'd like to read a little bit more if I could. I don't see my failure to reach adulthood as a defeat. I feel now as if I have survived almost unscathed the running of some gauntlet or other, blow after blow after blow. I see failing to grow up as a kind of victory against a certain everyday way of being a man, a clock-bound way, measured out in stages, swathed in duties and achievements, ticked off one by one before the final slide downhill into the usual dribbling nightmare of crossword puzzles, broken hips and daily incontinence. 
everything about that kind of manliness strikes me as time to perish before your eyes from year to year and finally month to month. The vigor, the virility, the power, the gait, the stance. In the lead up to the final shriveling, you can't hoodwink death, that's clear, but you can decline to join the conga line dancing to its door. <laughs> it's just lovely. Does that work for you? <laughs> it certainly works for me. It certainly works for me. Well, me. well I mean, yes, it is apropos, as you know, someone having said to me I'd failed to grow up, and I was startled when she said that. I wonder whether it was a gay thing, as I said, that I have failed to grow up, and perhaps it is, I don't know, really. But I probably have, in total, I think it's a good thing, really, because it allows me to play more than men who live more conventional lives, grown up lives can do because they have responsibilities that I simply don't have. So I can play more. And the wonderful thing about play that I think I mentioned in the book is that it always has a point. I mean, about your work, you might have to ask, does this have any point? I'm an accountant, I'm a fireman, I'm a market gardener. Does this have any point? Yes, okay, this small point, that small point, I feed people, I put fires out. But overall, does it have a point? With play, you never have to ask that. A game of chess has no point. It is simply pleasure. And Quote so, yourself again, Robert. I have played all my life, failing to stop on reaching manhood when you're supposed to take life seriously. I did get married and build a house, but it was a performance, not quite the same thing as it was for the man next door, shall we say. I can see that now. I began to earn my living as a teacher. Uh, still performing with relish, and eventually came out as a performer, performing openly once a week on national radio. Whether in rude health or suffering like Gainsborough from misdiagnosed swellings, didn't know that, as it were, sick unto death, it seemed too, once or twice, I kept on playing with some flair, or uh, if I say so myself. Absolutely. <laughs> That's another of those bulwarks. So we've learned over this past, um, well, nearly the hour, we are getting to the top of the clock, uh, several sort of bulwarks against uh, 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 against that sort of um, uh, <laughs> the loneliness of old age. Is Was this a book, Robert, I want to ask, that you had been thinking about writing for a long time? No. Uh, when Rita fell over in the village that she used to live in, so ironic that they call villages when they're not in yes, like village. Yes. In reality, they're full of old I people. I mean, who wants to live in a village full of old people? I've never understood that really. Yeah. After she fell over, she was taken to St. Ursula's, I'm calling it, which is the aged facility, something quite, quite different, where you die and you scream to be taken home. You can hear people screaming to be taken home every time you go in there. The day she fell over, so seriously she had to be taken there. I went to my office and I wrote down, Rita fell over again today. That's what I wrote down. I know the date I wrote it actually, just those few words. Rita fell over again today. And then I started to write about her falling over, about what happened and gradually, as will always happen, something grew, something flowered. That's how it happened. I didn't have a plan as such, no. Well, that's funny because the book dumb does come, uh, for a reader's point of view, it does come across as a journey in itself. Uh, <clears throat> I started this, this man, uh, you know, a lot of the great novels, of course, don't know the ending uh, when the writer started, but I particularly felt, and it wasn't a bad thing, Robert, that I don't think that you quite know where this is going yet. And I like that about it. Well, it takes the reader with you, don't you think, when, when you feel that? Absolutely. The reader feels more attached to you in a funny sort of way because they want to make sure you don't fall over. Or they might be looking <laughs> But they stay attached to you to see what might happen next. So uh, sometimes it's real. Sometimes, of course, I simply pretend that I don't know what's going to happen next. I actually do. Um, but I like people to think that it's more indeterminate than it perhaps always is. Did you picture yourself as an old, uh, as a young man? Did you spend time picturing yourself as an older man? Of course not. I mean, you can't begin to conceive of it, of course not. I thought I would be handsome and interesting and live, you see. Um, there you go, mate, I, there you go. I have to go to Pilates to keep live, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Next, 70 or 80 years, and you think that you will pass away picturesquely somewhere 
lying down with your friends gathered around you. And of course, it isn't like that at all. I mean, you crumble bit by bit, you see. That's what you don't foresee. Uh, life is made up of maintenance. That is the slightly depressing thing. <laughs> one maintains one's eyes, one's ears, one's skin, one's knees, one's ankles, one's inner organs. It's maintenance every day from start to finish. Um, we are getting close to having to, to go, but um, I love the, um, <clears throat> as it's not just the physical things, but fall, fall away, as you point out, but it's things like one's pomposity, hopefully, falls away. Not that I'm implying anything, Robert, at all. Oh, uh, one's opinions fall away, while one's, one's um, um, uh, 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 concrete perceptions of what you feel the world to be just start to crumble under your feet. I'd like to quote another one. Um, um, it will have long dawned on you that your values and opinions will never hold sway anywhere, not in Java or Egypt or Spain, obviously, but not even in Denmark. Your quaint little Weltanschauung, however sincerely held, is of no account and it matters little. Have you found that to be liberating though? Now I do find it to be liberating. I mean, about 20 years ago, I was terribly disappointed that the Roman Catholic Church had not disappeared. I'd grown up thinking that one day, surely, 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 surely this is especially over the last few years, surely, in red slippers and, and, and long frocks, that it would disappear. Surely people would say, no, it's doing very well, thank you very much. I mean, no one's going to church, but it's financially doing very well. It's still running education and hospitals in this country. It's well, it's strong. And now, I know that that's true, and I couldn't care less. <laughs> that's what happens to you. Strong, not strong, collapse, grow, I couldn't care less. Because I have got this huge inner life, which has no Catholicism in it, or Islam, or Judaism, or Buddhism, I have to be quite frank. It means a bit of Hinduism, but not in any belief sense, really. And I don't need those things. I don't care what happens to them. The world will go on without me. The things I hope for will not happen. It doesn't matter. Does that necessarily mean, does that necessarily follow the, that our, our, um, our judgmentalness, I don't think that's the right, right word, whatever the noun of judgmental, well, you know what I mean, does that fall away too? Or do we, do, or do we become worse as we get older? Not necessarily a funny thing happens, you see, you don't care. That's the point, you don't care. So you are at the one time more tolerant in the sense, whether the Pope or the Grand Mufti of Baghdad keeps making announcements or not is a matter of no interest to me. I'm not trying to shut them up, but at the same time, I'm not listening. So I'm intolerant. I can afford to say, I'm not interested. <laughs> It doesn't touch me. So you are both things. You're both accepting that things exist, but you also now have a much narrower, well, mental landscape, I think. Deeper, I hope. So you can appear to be both things. I don't think it means that you go out and vote for conservative parties. No, not at all, actually. Um, it's not that you become grumpier in that way but more likely to snap someone's head off if you think they've said something really stupid. Whereas when you're younger, you say things like, oh, is that the way you see it? Oh, that's very interesting. Can you explain to me more what you mean? Now you just turn away and, and walk off. You haven't got time. I can't imagine you've ever been one to suffer fool gladly, Robert. Has that increased as you've got older? Why can't you imagine that? <laughs> Because I would not want to be a fool around you, I, I have to say. Well, I mean, I don't try to wound anyone, actually, but I want my time to be well spent. I want to I want my minutes to be beautiful, and I don't want to be taken up by those who would exploit them. So, yes, I will cut people short. I suppose, and I've been criticized for that. And I suppose that's fair enough. I'm not on a mission, what am I on? I feel some things just 
are going to be too superficial. I mean, if a Mormon missionary comes to my front door, no, I'm not rude. I don't try to wound them, but I will say, I don't think that I'm the sort of person you need to spend time with. Thank you very much. And I shut the door. <laughs> very politely. You don't slam the door, you shut it. Good. Very politely, but, but firmly, but yes, not rudely. And so that's where it's arrived. I might be a little here. Yes, that's possible. Well, I'm glad we don't have to stop complaining, though, as we get older. Perhaps it, sh it, it, perhaps it could be um, um, groaning older well as well as growing older well. <laughs> Uh, one of the things, and we were nearly out of time, but one of the delightful um, um, uh, little vignettes that you offer us is that discussion, I think it's the end of the book, how with, with one of your friend, and, and as you say, you do end with a dance, you begin with a dance and you end with a dance, but the comment, and I think it was from um, um, uh, oh, Katerina, that of course, the things, of course, you can still be happy as you become older, perhaps the number of things, perhaps your happiness list shrinks as you get older, but the but the the happiness that you can derive from those shrinking list of things is often much deeper, which is a beautiful, a beautiful philosophy. Have you found that? In my better moments, I think that's what I find. Yes. One has more time in some ways now on any given day to let the things that, that one has found beautiful uh, speak to you in more complex ways and to research them and to go down into them. And one doesn't move about the world so much. And so just for that very reason, the world is more restricted. But one has one's good days and one has one's not so good days. That's the honest truth. Energy starts to fail. I'm sorry to have to say, there are probably people watching who know precisely what I mean. It doesn't mean that you don't have good spirits, but energy starts to fail. You simply can't do so many things, the things that you used to love doing. And then the awful irony of being old is that you get sleepy during the day and then you wake up wide awake during the night. It's a hideous irony, but it affects all of us. Well, so tired all the time. Lucky old age doesn't come at once. Thank goodness it's by increments. Is all, yes. Is all. yes, it is. It is. It is. <laughs> uh, it's been wonderful talking to you about this beautiful book, um, Robert De Say, the, the Time of Our Lives. To, to me, it's much more of a book about life than life than than will certainly death and how to live. And it does actually seem that you are still having the time of your life, Robert. Um, best of luck with the book. Who's put it out? Uh, Brio, I'm not sure. Have, you, have they been looking after you well? Yes, very well. They found you, you see. <laughs> yes, to, in, indeed. Oh, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this lovely spring day here. For the thank Arab you, everybody, for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Best of luck with the book, Robert.